This is The Saucer Life, a podcast in which we examine concepts, events, or people orbiting the world of flying saucers. Few preconceptions, snark when justified, no belief, no debunking. Today, we're going to be looking at the work of Eugene H. Drake, a contactee that very few people have ever heard of. And uh, I'll talk about how I came to learn of Drake as we get into things. But uh, just to set things out from the very beginning, the one thing people know about Drake, if they know anything about Drake, is that he seems to have pioneered some standard Adamski-style contactee tropes before George Adamski did. And Adamski was the supposed first sort of classical contactee of the contactee era. So did Adamski and Truman Bethram and other classic contactees just steal Drake's gimmick? That's a good question. Let's dive in. So I first heard about Eugene Drake back in 2017, not long after I started this show, um, on a website run by Hakan Blomquist out of Sweden. I think he's I think he's with the Archives for the Unexplained. Lots of great contacty information there. And then I, I promptly forgot about it until I think a listener wrote in about it a month or two ago, and I went back to uh, to, to the link that uh, that they shared, and I realized I, I had it bookmarked, and I recognized it. Um, and then, of course, of course, after I started working on this episode, um, right around the same time I started working on this episode, actually, Kurt Collins and Claude Falkstrom over at their great blog, The Saucers That Time Forgot, uh, posted a, a very extensive story covering uh, covering Eugene Drake. So I've been scooped, but. Hopefully, there are still a few of you out there that aren't in the loop on Eugene Drake, and hopefully, uh, we'll be able to um, to provide some uh, some additional insight and some additional ideas about this because it's a very interesting story and really highlights the role that that promotion and, and self promotion played in some saucer fiends becoming household names, at least among households who pay attention to UFO stuff, while others do not. And that's something that continues to this day, obviously. And I will make sure there are links to the Saucers That Time Forgot article and uh, Hakan Blomquist's article and and some other links that I used uh, in, the, in the show notes. I'll make sure those are there. Now, on to Eugene Drake. Who was he? Well, he was born in Pennsylvania in 1889. And by the early 20th century, by about 1910 or so, he was living in the Los Angeles area. He married. He had two daughters. He did various kinds of office work and was also getting involved in the film industry in various ways. And some of these things led to some problems for him in 1922. Here's how these problems were reported in the April 22, 1922 edition of the San Francisco Examiner. Cashier is held here as forger. Charged with forgery of $6,400 in checks of the New England Life Insurance Company, Eugene H. Drake, cashier of the company in Los Angeles, was arrested here last night on a warrant from the southern city sworn out by William A. Hamilton, general agent of the company. According to detectives David Murphy and William Prohl, Drake confessed to having realized upon the forged paper, using it in financing the feature film producing company of Santa Monica, of which he was president. So, stealing checks from his employer and using those checks to embezzle some money uh, or forge some money or steal some money, however you want to talk about it, from the insurance agency he worked for to finance the production of a film he was working on. So, I wasn't able to find out what happened as a result of this case. Uh, he He – confessed, so I assume there was some sort of guilty plea, but no one else has been able to figure it out either uh, from what I've been able to see. So regardless of how things turned out, Drake remained in Southern California, working in several fields, according to census records. He worked in sales, he was a restaurant cook, and according to his World War II draft card, he was self-employed at some kind of 
self-employment. At some point, probably during the 1940s, although I've nothing to back that up other than the fact that we don't hear any mention of it till the 1940s, Drake established something called the Fellowship of Golden Illumination and was doing lectures around Southern California. This ad appeared in the Long Beach Press-Telegram on Saturday, November 13th, 1948. Universal Truth Church, Baker Auditorium, 1535 American, Adele Ferrara, Thursday, 7.30 p.m., Eugene Drake of the Fellowship of Golden Illumination, speaking on the impending golden age. All New Thought students invited. Those are really all the details we have. Another ad in a Long Beach newspaper um, established that – a different Long Beach newspaper, The Independent, established that Adel Ferrara that's mentioned here was the minister of the Universal Truth Church. So what were Drake's spiritual teachings at this time? Well, it's unclear. He didn't write much and a lot of what he did write, we don't really have access to. Nowadays, there are bits and pieces floating around and you'll find the same bits and pieces um, that I talk about here, talked about on um, on the blogs that, that talk about it. And those are pretty much the writings that are uh, that are extant. And we don't really have anything from the pre-Saucer era. So he's talking about the impending golden age in 1948, November of 1948. This is over a year after the flying saucer craze has started. People have started talking about flying saucers. George Adamski has started talking about flying saucers and talking about his sightings of motherships. Um, he's not predating the, he's not the first person to talk about UFOs when he begins to talk about UFOs. So when does Drake talk about UFOs in a format or a forum that we have access to? Well, we can jump ahead to 1950 and his book, Visitors from Space, or really a booklet, Visitors from Space. It's 34 pages long and begins with a foreword. The data compiled herein is presented to those interested in the subject of visitations from space by beings of superior intelligence, with the hope that they be alerted to the fast-changing conditions as they affect this planet. Even though the atomic warfare never takes place, the fact that several nations are firing such test bombs of destructive magnitude is creating great mental harm with individuals as well as monstrosities of diabolical activity that will come into manifestation at a later period, and in this respect alone warrants cessation. Vibratory waves are penetrating into gas belts in the crust of the Earth, which are bringing increased earthquake disturbances, affecting the atmosphere, causing a repetition of storms and floods, the melting of the polar caps, but worst of all is the hate pattern being built up in the consciousness of peoples the world over. Creative law is being violated by this activity, threatening humanity everywhere. Black magicians can do nothing but destroy. They do not know how to build, only to tear down. Psychotic minds are unconsciously aligned with them. The Elder Brothers from Space, the forces of the White Brotherhood, are here in greater array than any time since man walked the Earth. They have the answers. We salute them. Right away, we see some similarities with George Adamski's writings. Uh, creative law and vibratory waves, very similar to George Adamski's cosmic law ideas. The Cosmic Philosophy book we talked about back in January was published in the 1960s, but the core ideas Adamski presents in that book and about all this stuff in general reach back into the 1930s as we've uh, as we've seen as we've seen before. So, let's take a look at this Flying Saucer book and we'll return to the idea of of what things might have been taken from where and from whom. Uh, later and as we go. So don't worry, I will solve this entire mystery of who might have been copying whom, probably. The page immediately following the foreword is just headed flying saucers. I'm, I'm sort of gesturing in, in with my hands in big letters, flying saucers, and presents um, some illustrations of various saucer types that look a bit rude. I, I think I'll use this as the, um, the, the episode art for this episode just because it's amusingly rude and, and although often I, I find um, sort of, oh my gosh, doesn't this saucer look like a wang? Jokes to be kind of puerile. Um, 
I'll make an exception for this <laughs> for whatever reason. Maybe I'm feeling particularly immature today. But um, Eugene Drake begins this book, uh, Visitors from Space, subheaded Spaceships, Discs, and Flying Saucers, by saying that – spacecraft have had earth under constant observation for a long time and quote we have been in contact with them since 1930 at that time we were in santa monica and contact was made in a large field where the santa monica city college is now located only during the past few years have they chosen to reveal their presence end quote this may be the most low-key sort of revelation that somebody has had an alien contact that i've ever seen of course we don't have anything from 1930 through 1950 where he talks about these contacts so did he have these contacts or did he have you know something happen and then he grafts ufos or space travel onto it post 1947 or did did nothing happen? Um, it would be easy to point out his um, run-in with the law and forgery back in 1922 as a disqualifying event for uh, accepting his uh, his explanations or his stories about anything. I, I think that – I mean I can see why people would do that. I'm not sure – I would do that. I would. I would prefer to ignore the fact that he was a, uh, a a a forger in the past and focus on the fact that he presents no actual evidence. So, what does he tell us about these spaceships? These spaceships, with their disks or flying saucers, as some call them, had their commanders so desired, could have and still can take over this planet at any time. However, they have no desire to interfere with our life here. They only wish to assist us in arriving at a clearer understanding of the immutable laws governing this and all solar systems, and to help us build a more wonderful, beautiful, and peaceful civilization. I think it's fascinating that we've got something that is very much a, a stereotypical space brother contactee kind of scenario here published and distributed a couple years before Adamski had his uh, had his in encounter. Um, he goes on to explain the spaceships. Says some of them are huge um, with the parent ships, not mother ships. I like how he, he doesn't gender the large spaceships. He says the parent ship um, is at least 7,000 feet long and 500 feet in diameter with a crew of approximately 2,500 beings. There's officers in charge with pilots and navigators and observers and technicians and scientists and other members required, he says, in the operation of the ship. And then there are smaller craft being used in their visitation plan. Um, the ships are powered by electromagnetic force and they are heavily armed with powerful ray weapons. Their cruising speed is about 27,000 miles per hour, which is amazing. Uh, but in outer space, for interplanetary travel, they go even faster. But they don't carry a lot of fuel. They are able to convert the energy of light into electromagnetic force to propel their craft. I'm not sure how that would actually work. This further explanation of how they operate is – is kind of interesting for reasons that I think you might find interesting. I had no way to end that sentence. Let's turn it over to Eugene Drake. They come into our atmospheric belts from their planets, not in solid form, but in an etheric form. Upon entering our atmosphere, they, through their superior knowledge, change the atomic elements in the construction of these ships and materialize them into the density which they are now using. The beings on these various craft are also passed from the etheric to a dense form of matter and appear to materialize. By speeding up the vibratory frequency of the atoms of the elements of which these craft are made, as stated before, they can move with great speeds, invisible to our physical sight, and when they desired, slow them down and congeal this atomic energy to a more solid form. There are elements known to them of which our scientists have no knowledge or understanding, which they use and mold in whatever form, idea, or shape they wish. I will admit, when I first read this section, as I read this booklet, I saw the word etheric and my mind instantly went to 
the Borderland Science Research Associates folks and, and Mark Probert's channelings, which talked about the ether ships and the etheric beings and things like that. But Drake describes this in a much more sort of sciency kind of way. And I would be interested to know what kinds of ideas like this might have been circulating in science fiction writing at the time, because it's a very science fictional idea. Although, like many science fictional things, except for flying cars, we see echoes of it in our own uh, sort of scientific and technological development here in the 21st century. Uh, one of the things this idea reminded me of, that, that there's, there's matter that they can shape and form into whatever they want, reminded me of the idea of catoms or claytronic atoms, basically programmable matter that, um, that some, uh, some people – are working with. And I, I will admit that I, I first learned about this idea in a Star Trek book uh, probably 15 years ago. So I'm, I'm not some sort of, you know, science, uh, science news nerd, but uh, I am a Star Trek nerd and that's where I, I find these ideas. But the idea that there is this matter that can be programmed or shaped into any number of things uh, is is pretty fascinating. So it sort of has you know relations to nanotechnology and, uh, and and technology like that. Drake goes on to explain that the Space Brothers are obviously concerned about the atomic weapons that we have been setting off, uh, and they are quote assembling for the increased violence on the Earth, the speeding up of the so called Cold War, and also to keep the atmosphere cleared of radioactive vibrations. End quote. There are holes in the atmosphere that have been created by the use of atomic weapons. However, the Space Brothers have um, have fixed that, and quote they have sent what they call fireballs blazing through our air to purify the same of radioactive particles and to prevent further vibratory waves traveling to the other planets, rather confining the same to where they are originating. So, atomic weapons testing has wrecked some stuff, but it's been fixed, and it presents a danger to the rest of the universe, but they have fixed that as well. So this is what they have come to uh, to, to fix, and uh, the commander of the mission that Drake talked to had some things to say to explain about this. The commander in charge of this expedition, to whom I've been talking, advised that any wide-scale atomic or hydrogen bombings will necessitate the use of powers beyond our conception to eliminate laboratories, airplane plants, planes, and such plants where such bombs are made and assembled, and the planes carrying them, as well as take in charge the beings controlling such destructive activity. Many of these space visitors are from Venus, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, and Uranus, although some of them are coming now from other solar systems, working in harmony with those whom we call elder brothers of this solar system. The solar system is in charge of a great cosmic being who directs all life under the great creative plan. The elder brothers, or Ethereans, work under his direct supervision. Civilization will not be permitted to be destroyed as it was almost during the struggle between the Titans and the Atlans, Lemurians, prior to the sinking of Lemuria and Atlantis. Lemurians, Atlanteans, ancient destructions, um, elder brothers, and great beings controlling things, and, and the reference earlier to the, uh, the White Brotherhood. There's a lot of this that goes back to earlier esoteric and theosophical ideas, as we've seen in a number of examples from contacteeism and early UFOism during the 1940s and early 1950s. Um, there's not much new about what Drake is saying for us who have read about these things before, but what is interesting and what was new at the time, at least in a printed form, as far as I can tell, is that Drake was connecting these esoteric ideas explicitly to human-like beings from solar system planets who have concerns about the atomic bomb. Now, I say in print because we know that George Adamski was talking about these things. We know that before Drake publishes this book, Adamski has published his science fiction novel, Pioneers of Space, which had similar ideas to what Adamski would talk about later and that Drake is talking about here. But we cannot get around the fact, we can't ignore the fact that Drake has claimed contact with these beings. Now, if I was a, a Damsky 
protege or booster, I might say that uh, that, that Adamski's ideas might have been given to him by the Space Brothers in some sort of non-physical way, uh, that he might have channeled some of their ideas, some even unconsciously, into pioneers of space. I, I don't think that's the case, but I think it's fascinating that that Drake is, pardon the use of the word here, pioneering these ideas in 1950. Next, Drake talks about the various kinds of craft they have. Um, some are escort and fighter craft. Some are resemble a donut and have a crew of 50. One is 100 feet across. They have very many different kinds of craft, mostly distinguished by their size and the size of, uh, of, of the crew. Some are controlled by larger craft that are anywhere from two feet to 15 feet across shaped like tops and have been mistaken for fireballs. They're basically drones, basically UFO drones. But there's other um, other uh, technology they have that is actually a bit more disturbing than their heavily armed flying saucers. They have a visiscope, which they can focus so minutely as to look not only into a room where people are, but right into their brains watching the pulsations when they are talking or thinking. The brain cells throw off colorful lights as they vibrate. Some vibrate but little. The right side of many Earth people's brains are almost in a dormant state. They have an instrument that is about a foot square on top, and then it is bell-shaped, somewhat like a green pepper, flat on the bottom, which they set in the middle of a craft, and from the light energy picked up from our atmosphere by this instrument, it begins to oscillate. The top section moving clockwise, the other parts of the bell portion moving both counterclockwise and clockwise. As this movement increases in tempo, waves of light energy are pushed out into the ship and beyond its walls for considerable distance, and these waves are of many colors. This motion vibrates so fast that the craft sets up a slight humming sound and under the control of the operator shoots out into space at terrific speeds. This is the color seen by Earth people as the craft travels through the atmosphere. I do like the very gentle segue from talking about the device that can see into the inner workings of the human brain to the thing like a top that makes the colors come out of the flying saucer. So they've surveyed our craft. They've they've surveyed us. They've surveyed our brains. They possibly know about more about us than we know about ourselves. And even the things we do know probably don't come from our own own brains. This is an interesting idea that Drake talks about. Many of our scientists, musicians, poets, etc. have received much of their understanding from higher minds, both carnate and disincarnate, who have drawn close and impressed upon their consciousness ideas which they claim as their own. This intelligence originated in the higher spheres of consciousness and was given to them that humanity be benefited and civilizations lifted up to more wonderful expression. Many wonderful inventions have been seized by unscrupulous people, capitalized upon for their own personal gain with little real thought for the upliftment of humanity, except they had the financial means to purchase the same. All of our best ideas come from the space people, or at least the etheric mind that is shared in by the space people. After a while of talking about this technological stuff, Drake gets to the personnel of the ship uh, and the commander that he talked to named Aramia. So what's Aramia like? And does he sound like anybody we might have met before? The commander of one of these spaceships, known as Aramia, is 5 feet 10 inches tall, very dignified, solidly built, fairly broad through the shoulders. His hair is long and golden. The cheeks are pink, eyes large and blue, his chin strong. He has a very pleasant expression. He wears a tight-fitting tunic of pearl-shade silk with gold and blue trim, the collar of which is three inches high, open a little at the throat, with gold tabs at the ends. On the shoulders of the tunic are golden epaulets, somewhat similar to the boards worn by naval officers. He wears tight-fitting trunks of the same material, pearl silk, with a golden zipper up one side of the calf. His shoes are a soft, golden, metallic material. While his manner is gracious, he is very commanding. One can feel the magnetic force emanating from this person. His command ship is from the planet Venus. Aramia is kind of an amalgamation, and Collins and Falkstrom sort of bring this up too, um, or at least some of it. I, 
I can't remember exactly, but okay. They point out this is very similar to Orthon, the long blonde hair, things like that. I think there's definitely some Orthon elements here, but him being a commander of a spaceship, having this commanding presence and charisma, I, I think this is a guy who looks like Orthon, but his personality is, or just a lot of how this is described, is very, um, very Ashtar like. So, this is interesting. It's like uh, it's like a pilot episode for the entire contactee era. A little later, we learn more about uh, about the crew and about what they wear and what they look like. And I've got to say, these these uniforms sound very kind of ornate and very cool with the the gold and and the, the golden zipper up the calf. I like that. Uh, I like that detail. But who else is on the ship? The crew is composed of Venusians from 36 to 42 inches tall. They are well proportioned. Their skin is a light cream color covered with fuzz-like hair, like the down on a peach. Their eyes are large and blue, with hair blonde to golden. Brows fairly heavy, arched but little. They go about their work silently, eyes flashing, at times smiling. Their uniforms are light blue, close-fitting tunics and trunks, with shoes of the same material fitting tight around the ankles. Many have gold ornaments on their uniforms, indicative of rank. The commander Aramia advises that these little people are a specific racial type on Venus, and that a race of little men and women are to be found on Mars as well, while on Saturn they have a race a little taller but heavier and more gross in appearance. On Uranus and Neptune are races of giants. The little men of Venus and Mars are highly skilled in the handling of mechanical and electrical machinery. You might even call them wizards when you consider their ability and knowledge. I like that they're not all the same, that there are different kinds of people on different planets. And there isn't any um, overt indicators of uh, status based on on appearance or or species or or race. I'm I'm not sure how you want to say it, although it is kind of uh, telling that uh, Commander Aramia is one of the taller sort of human looking people and that the people doing the real work are the little fuzzy – short people. We also get a little bit of insight into the the way sort of people interact with each other on these ships. The operators of these craft, when reporting, stand at attention before one of the officers or the commander and make their statements telepathically. They salute by extending the right arm palm up with the hand slightly above shoulder height. When the commander gives an order telepathically to any of his crew, one can feel the vibratory effect of this thought beam and the force with which it is directed seems to electrify those to whom it is sent as they snap into activity at once. That telepathic order-giving system sounds a little bit like um, mind control or some sort of uh, thought control sort of process, and that salute, extending the right arm palm up with the hand slightly above shoulder height. Um, I know what that sounds like to me, it sounds kind of Nazi-ish, uh, but uh, I don't know. Maybe we don't need to draw any necessary conclusions from that. Now, nah, it, it sounds a lot like a Nazi salute. Later on, we meet another commander uh, named Estralon. She is um, the second flight commander, so ranks below Aramia, and she has a ship of her own, they say. She is about five feet, four inches tall has the creamiest pink complexion I have ever seen on any girl. These Venusians all look so young, it's difficult to tell their ages. Her large blue eyes are like mysterious pools of sparkling waters, full of enchantment. She is wearing a uniform not unlike the one worn by Commander Aramia, which reveals a very trim figure. I imagine she weighs about 115 pounds. While I could not understand what she is saying to me in her Venusian tongue, telepathically, I am able to coordinate her delightful musical tones comprehensively. Okay, Jean, settle down a little bit. Uh, Is Estralon the only woman on board? Oh, goodness, no. I noticed the other women on board, all in uniform, carrying out various tasks, yet none of them could compare to Estralon in figure and beauty. Her love power is intense as I am held in its radiance. I just seem to melt into her presence for a moment as her magnetic aura blends with and overshadows my own. 
I could only nod my head as she is presented to me, as I am still shaken from head to feet by the dynamic wave of love in which she had enveloped me. I assume you all caught one particular phrase in there, but if not, none of them could compare to Estralon in figure and beauty. This is not terribly far from Truman Bethram's main squeeze, Aura Reigns, being tops in shapeliness and beauty. Uh, Collins and, uh, and, and Falkstrom noted that, and uh, I, I noted that they noted it as I read their article on it. Um, and, and then you, you see the words figure and beauty, and you think tops and shapeliness and beauty. And they're definite, I mean, that's, that's not coincidence. I, I wouldn't call that coincidence. If a student paraphrased something in that way and didn't cite where they paraphrased that phrase from, my plagiarism sensors would go off. It's, it's suspect at best. Estralon teaches Drake about all kinds of things, including about the origins of life on Earth. The first beings on your planet Earth were landed by spacecraft. They were selected by the Elder Brothers for their purity, wisdom, ability, and strength from those volunteering from other planets, not only of this solar system, but from others belonging to what is known as a Cosmodon or Federation of Planets of other solar systems. Their instructors were from the planets Mercury and Venus, who, when their period of instructed had ended, returned to their respective planets. Other planets are now being peopled in the same way now. As we get toward the end of the book, and I should say that idea of the space people seeding our planet with their own people, another very common idea that is going to arise in some contactee and some non-contactee UFO writings throughout the, the 1950s and 60s. There's a lot here that Drake is putting together. He, he's not inventing anything really from whole cloth. Um, as with all contactee, early contact details, the the overtones from from spiritualism stuff and, and channeling are are very clear. But he's he, like I said before, you can't get around the fact that he is the one who's sorting sort of putting these pieces together in ways that he hasn't been recognized for. And I, I certainly haven't recognized him for it because I didn't know about him until relatively recently. And I, I feel like I should rewrite my contact ebook because, you know, there needs to be a sort of prologue about Eugene Drake near the end of the book. Drake is able to meet with some people from planets other than Venus. The Jupiterians are very dignified and stately. The leaders are very tall and dark-skinned. They have peculiar facial expressions unlike those of any other planet. Their eyes are large, soft, and very brilliant, dark brown in color. Their faces are long, one half longer than people of Earth. Some of these stand 7 to 12 feet tall. They are very well built according to Earth standards. Their women are very beautiful, graceful, and well formed and are considered some of the graceful of the planets, even though they have this odd facial characteristic. Their skin is very smooth and radiant. Some of the men wear beards. Visitors from Space closes with Estralon and Aremia speaking, giving a speech sort of in, in unison or, or together. And they, they basically reiterate this idea that the people of Earth, the leaders of Earth, need to, um, need to get their act together. And uh, they, they sort of get into some geopolitical stuff here. We whom you call space beings are not deceived by your window dressing, peace talks, for we are now in possession of the facts. We know the secret plans in the vaults of all nations. We know the people of Earth want peace with all other people. We know that certain leaders do not want peace, except as they can dictate it. We know that your group of nations have lost control of the situation and are not able in their divided activity to bring about peace, because within their own ranks, they are not in agreement. We know the basic principles set forth when this group was organized was not actuated by holy premises, therefore will not endure any more than your past League of Nations. In your own language, Earthman, you cannot have a rotten apple in a barrel and not have the whole barrel of apples affected, even cause the barrel to become rotten too. Your leaders are deceiving no one but themselves, but the sad part of it is they would rather destroy a civilization, even a planet, than stand in the light of right principle and action. 
Therefore, we, as stated, will not stand by and see this earth destroyed as it was in the previous atomic war, even though many of your people hardly warrant better. We space beings, your elder brothers, shall, if necessary, use powers beyond your knowledge to preserve the earth and those who will be chosen to become leaders in the New Age dispensation. There are some similarities and some differences here from later contactee things. The idea of protecting Earth in some way from disaster and preserving some of the people who are worthy of being, quote, leaders in the New Age dispensation is very much like what would be promoted in the Ashtar books later in the 1950s and onward through um, you know, the present uh, the present day. Of course, both of both this and the uh, the Ashtar stuff have heavy overtones of uh, eschatological overtones of of a rapture of the worthy and things like that. So it might not be that somebody like George Van Tassel was copying from Drake um, in so uh, as as much as you've got Drake and Van Tassel both sort of copying from the Book of Revelation or something. But the spaceship angle makes it again. Again, a little, a little suspect. So that's a similarity, but a difference, I think, is from from the the Adamski stuff at least, is that these these space brothers are perfectly willing to 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 intervene. Uh, there, there's no indication that they expect Earth leaders to do the right thing, and they do draw a distinction between the leaders of nations and the people in those nations, which I think is uh, is nice. So that is that is this book, Visitors from Space, and it is a uh, it is a a bit of a bombshell uh, as far as finding this and, and experiencing this and reading about this as as uh, a few people have written about it online and realizing that some of these ideas uh, slightly predated some other things that came out. We'll talk more about that uh, after the break as we also get into another Eugene Drake pamphlet. A visit to Venus. Sound familiar? If you like the saucer life and want more, you can support us in exchange for bonus content. Uh, our most recent uh, bonus episode for the saucer life over at the Chizo Media Patreon um, involved uh, looking at some current events in UFO world and the UF hashtag UFO Twitter response to those as well as a, uh, a video watch along of a TV program from 1955 wherein an old man in Ireland thinks he sees aliens. Um, that was that was a lot of fun. It's been almost a year since we started up the Chizo Media Patreon, and we've built a nice library of materials there, not just from The Saucer Life, but from uh, our other show, Great Lakes Lore, as well. You can check it out at patreon.com slash Chizo Media or via the link in the show notes. You can also check out past episodes of the show at Saucer Life or inside your favorite podcast app. And as always, we're in, always we're on Twitter and Instagram at Saucer Life, and you can email us at thesaucerlife at gmail.com. If you would like to contact us by post, which is always fun, you may do so at Chizo Media, P.O. Box 68, Grand Blank, Michigan, 48480. So now we have some feedback on our uh, Incident at Exeter episode and um the the one comment i got more than ever more than anything else from a couple different people was uh, some surprise and in some cases some disappointment that i didn't talk about fuller's incident at exeter book and i do want to be clear i have read the book i did read the book i just didn't read the book until after i had looked through the the project blue book materials and for better or worse while there is some incredibly interesting stuff in the fuller book I uh, I do stand by my decision to have focused on the um, focused on the blue book reports and that sort of paper trail and that back and forth as sort of the focus on that episode. Correspondent Lester says, "Good calm UFO story, but boring. No Schmidt type con men, no car type obsessive nutburgers, no cults in consequence. I look forward to a Sean David Morton episode. Also more UFO cults, um, that of Bowen Peep, etc." Yeah, it was a a good calm UFO story. I don't think it was a boring story. Uh, you can't have Reinhold Schmidt every time. Uh, we'd uh, we'd we'd have to close down for lack of interesting con artists. Uh yeah, there's going to be a Sean David Morton episode. 
at some point. That's a that's a big job though. Uh, Doc uh, Doc um, Doc Pinko on Twitter says maybe I'm off base with this comment. Tell me if you think I am. But if Bertrand says he doesn't know what the UFO was, he can't therefore be certain it wasn't an aircraft. Maybe I'm overthinking it. We academics can do that. We certainly can. Um, I don't think you're overthinking it. I think that uh, Bertrand, you know, it, he did say he doesn't know what it was, but he knows it wasn't any sort of conventional aircraft with which he was familiar. Um, he doesn't jump entirely into the UFO or the extraterrestrial hypothesis, but um, there is some wiggle room there in what he's saying for some type of non-conventional terrestrial aircraft to be uh, to be at fault. Uh, Debbie, sort of speaking more generally and sharing an interesting story, Debbie says, hello, saucer people. Since Aaron and the saucer wife are in Michigan, I want to share this little trivia with you. I've been listening to audiobooks of the Cat Who series by Lillian Jackson Braun available on YouTube. They all take place in a fictional county in the northern Midwest of the USA, far from any big cities. The county and towns are not real, but many think the author was thinking of Michigan, probably the UP. 400 miles north of everywhere, as the characters say. The one I last listened to is called The Cat Who Saw Stars and follows the lead character, a newspaper reporter, and his two Siamese cats on a brief vacation in a cabin on the shores of a large lake. This resort community claims to have an unusual number of UFO sightings, and many residents believe they are being visited. Our hero scoffs at this for the whole story until at the very end, when he has a strange experience of his own. I have to wonder if Ms. Braun was aware of Michigan's claims of this kind of activity. It's a sweet and interesting story, and your listeners might enjoy it. Just wanted to share how I'm finding the saucer topic crawling into many areas of entertainment. Love your show. Thanks for your work. Thank you, Debbie. And um, I haven't read uh, any of the Lillian Jackson Braun sort of uh, mystery books, and I, I think they – Unless I'm wrong, they very much fit into that uh, that genre of cozy uh, cozy mystery, which is incredibly popular. There is actually a paranormal themed cozy mystery series set in Roswell uh, that um, that the uh, the saucer wife and I are going to be reading and talking about for a, a Patreon bonus episode. So that's going to be uh, going to be kind of fun. But I think I might need to check out the cat who saw stars because that sounds. Like definitely like something I would want to uh, I would want to know about. Finally, we have an email signed from uh, a secret reptilian Dero from the center of the Earth. Just finished listening to the primary Gulf Breeze stuff, and a trend that I noticed there, and it really is a theme in a lot of ufology, seems to be that no one gets along at all. Ufologists, at least contemporary ones, seem to fit into a pattern of interesting viewpoint or person is adopted. Ufologists slash UFO nuts become personally invested in the new idea or person, defending zealously. Viewpoint becomes ingrained into the discourse to the point that even the disbelievers of person or argument are using it in their language. No new results, new findings, nothing of interest brings increasing ire as people have nothing new to engage with. People turn on the idea or researcher at an increasing pace, incorporating conspiracy language into why it failed. So-and-so was a plant, disinformation from X, etc. Concept is abandoned or defended by an increasingly dedicated fringe of the fringe. I know and am very interested in your research of conspiracy culture, and I'm wondering if there's any way to liberate ufology from this perspective. How do we stop the cycle? Is there any real, genuine way to create healthy discourse among the voices in ufology instead of just regurgitating Roswell or conspiracy at each other? Thank you so much. Love the show. Thank you, secret reptilian Dero from the center of the earth. And I think your your sort of pattern of how UFO discourse works is is very easily easy to illustrate from various uh, various points in the history of the topic. I think you can pull out any number of examples of how this works. Now, as for liberating ufology from conspiracy, I, I think as long as the bulk of ufology remains focused on an extraterrestrial hypothesis and physical objects in the air, you're going to necessarily have overtones of governments hiding things and government cover-ups, and that, of course, is is always fodder for conspiracy thinking. I think the only real way to uh, to liberate ufology from conspiracism is, or would be, for ufology to increasingly move in a direction that it has been 
dipping in and out of in various areas for its very existence of making ufology be considered one aspect of a broader spectrum of paranormal activity uh, of of putting of putting ufology in the same category as hauntings or uh, little people sightings or other folkloric aspects of things the problem with that is you can also have conspiracies that are based around those things. Why are the scientists covering up the extra-dimensional nature of UFOs? Things like that. I don't know if there is a way to fully divorce ufology from conspiracism. I uh, Sadly, I suspect that it won't happen in any sort of total way way. But I, I think efforts to examine ufology and UFO sightings and encounters through a, a folkloric lens is a step in the right direction. But I'm not sure if the UFO industrial complex will um, will permit that. But it, it's a good question and something that, that I've been uh, ruminating on for a, uh, a, a very long time. Increasingly, I am um, convinced that conspiracy thinking ruins so many things. But not Eugene Drake. It doesn't ruin Eugene Drake, at least not yet. So let's get back to Eugene Drake and his visit to Venus. <laughs> Okay, Life on Other Planets, A Visit to Venus from the Fellowship of a Golden of Golden Illumination by Eugene H. Drake is uh, it's about 22 pages. It's another little booklet, and it seems to have appeared in 1951 or so, so the next year after the uh, the initial book. And it uh, it opens not with a four. Oh, it is copyright 1950. So, um actually now that I now that I see that. So, very much hard on the heels of Drake's first pamphlet. It's got a, uh, a a sort of drawing of the solar system on the cover, and inside the front cover there is a, a beautiful pencil drawing of the uh, the the space commander Estrelon, uh, a picture of her, it's the same picture that is in uh, in the first book. And instead of opening with a foreword, we open with a uh, sort of dedication and thanks to various people. We want to express our gratitude and thank all who have contributed to the inspirational information incorporated into this booklet. Venus, the planet of affection. Anil, star angel. Sunat Kumara, logos. Aramia, Estrelon, Endros. Mars, the planet of action. Samael, star angel. Boo! It is then followed by eight hyphens. Saturn, the planet of concentration. Cassiel, star angel. Ura. Jupiter, the planet of abundance, Zachariel, star angel, Barasa, and Alonzo P. Mathewson, astronomer, formerly court astronomer to King George III, now instructor of etheric realms. I'll be honest, I have no idea what almost any of that means. I recognize the names of, uh, of Estrelon and Aramia, though. So, what is the, the point of this book? It's a visit to Venus. Drake says first after soon after rather his first contact with the Venusian commander Aramia and Estrelon, which he says the first contact was in 1930, but they're talking about atomic weapons. But he mentioned the League of Nations. I forgot to bring this up, but the League of Nations wasn't a thing by 1949 or 1950. The timeline really is all over the place. But in any case, he is having another contact. Uh, he is c contacted by Aramia and Estrelon. He gets a visitation at, from Estrelon who tells him to go to a certain desert location to be picked up. I kind of wonder if it was desert center near where Adamski had his meeting with Orthon. On board the ship, he describes bunks and control panels, and, and he's being showed around by Estrelon. And it, they don't just walk around the ship. It's a strange way of, of sort of interacting and getting around. Estrelon is now standing in the control room watching the various panels. The operators have already taken their respective positions. At this point, the most unusual spectacle that I have ever witnessed begins when Estrelon suddenly inclines her head as though in silent prayer and gradually appears to be growing taller to a height of almost eight feet. Powerful waves of magnetic and electrical forces emanate in all directions from her body. 
As I glance around me, everyone within range of my vision has become electrified and radiant, standing at attention at specific stations. Estralon raises her right hand, moves it in a wide circle three times, and brings her arm down to her side. As she does so, I observe the expression on her face changing to one of commanding mien. All at once, the entire vessel is filled with a bluish-white phosphorescent light. Officers and crew alike begin to glow in the light, thus becoming more etheric. Leaning forward and taking me by the hand, Estralon lifts me clear of the ship's deck as though I were no heavier than a feather. In this position, I am carried to the room assigned to me, where I am put on the cot like an infant. Bending over me, she softly touches her lips to my forehead and then departs. A comfortable warmth creeps through me, making me feel very much at peace, and slowly I drift off into a state of suspended animation. Not until we draw near to Venus am I disturbed or changed from that state. The condition is altered by Estralon, who enters the room and touches my forehead with the tip of a finger. Its light touch serves to induce me to regain my normal consciousness. Then she gestures for me to follow her. I note that her size has resumed ordinary proportions, but none of the magnetism has departed. We enter the control room again, and I am led to the space mirror, where I stand fascinated by what I see. I think it's really interesting that he he sort of takes up this etheric idea and how their form changes at various times, and that some of their, their personal electromagnetic energy is connected to the travel, and that he – as a human, I presume, because it's because he's a human, has to travel in suspended animation between Earth and Venus. I, I think that's fascinating. So on the space mirror, which is kind of a view screen, what he sees is Venus. And he's they're coming into Venus, they're going through the atmosphere, and he tells us about it. It is a beautiful place, of course. The architecture is like nothing on Earth. Beautiful parks surround the buildings. The people are beautiful once they leave the ship and land. Uh, the people are beautiful. They're tall and blonde with blonde hair. Tall and blonde with blonde hair. They're tall and blonde with golden hair, he says. Beautiful blue eyes sparkle with kindness. Their clothes are, are very pastel, uh, pink, light blue, light green, lemon, orange, light purple, lavender, and orchid. Um, they wear gold jewelry and ornaments. It looks like a beautiful science fictional place. The people, he says, are highly advanced spiritually, mentally, and physically. Um, they've got magical technology. They, they've got wisdom. Uh, and then then he goes to Estralon's house, which is, uh, which is kind of neat. And he describes her, uh, her lawn. The lawns are covered with a pinkish blue-green grass, the blades of which are strange to me. The flowers are of such hue and shape that it is difficult to describe them. They resemble snowflakes in pattern, are radiant in color and dewy in texture. Their delicate fragrance is wafted upon the breeze blowing softly around the spot. The trees are not tall, hardly 15 feet in height. They are colorful, as are the shrubs and plants. One does not see as much vivid green in the foliage on Venus as on Earth, but yellow and lavender are much in evidence. Gorgeous rose bushes flourish among the other flowers, which are interspersed by beautiful ferns. The Venusians inform me that the impending golden age on Earth will bring many startling changes in the foliage of trees, vines, shrubs, plants, and flowers. Also, a sublime expansion in the personalities of its inhabitants will take place as the harmony of peace and brotherly love abides in the unfolding consciousness of the superior races that are destined to occupy Earth. I think it's a fascinating idea that the the golden age of of wisdom and and earth being inhabited by beings who are fully in tune with the cosmos and things like that is going to affect the plant life and the appearance of the plant life. I think that is absolutely fascinating. We go through a few pages of basically Drake talking about Estralon's family. Uh, of course, they're all beautiful and wise. The, the, the father is, is handsome and brilliant. The mother is, is beautiful. The little sister is, um, I think it's, a, I think it's a younger sister. That's the impression I got is beautiful and affectionate to Drake and is, is wearing some outfit with a bare midriff. Um, so, uh, so, so Drake is, is really, really kind of far gone on the, um, on, on the pretty space women. You just want to say, you know, you know, Grandpa Drake, please stop talking about the young, uh, the young women. And as we get to the end of this pamphlet, we uh, we see Drake. You know, he's able to enter the chamber where the members of the the Venusian Council are. Um, 
are and, and members of council from other planets are are meeting and he uh, he's able to interact with their political leadership a bit. And what, what's great about it is um, it, it, there's there's characters and there's there's sort of plot development. And we see the relations between these people. He says, while I'm in the chamber, I observe all the members of the council turn toward the door. It swings open and this very striking person, tall and handsome, wearing the uniform of a space officer comes in. Estralon flashes the thought to me, this is my brother Estuadar. He is just in from the planet Jupiter. End quote. Just in from Jupiter, sis. How are things going here on Venus? It's just, it's very, very science fiction-y. And I know a lot of contactee stuff is. It always is. Um, very, very sort of suspect that it's so science fiction-y. But there's some great, uh, there's some great writing here. Um, talks about a who has, who has, you know, wings, uh, which is strange. But this, this sentence, um, this phrase is just great. Estuadar, the Birdman from Uranus. The Birdman from Uranus needs to be a movie. It might have been a movie. It feels like it should have been a movie. So as the as the book concludes, um, we we hear some more about very much um, very very similar to what we saw in the first book. Um, there are you know higher thoughts out in the cosmos and the ether on the vibratory waves that people who are sufficiently advanced can uh, can tune into. Uh, we hear more about the little people on these planets um, who are quote merely workers, which sounds a bit uh, a bit dismissive. They're the same people, I believe, um, who were working on the ship, uh, but it's 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 very. It's very interesting because uh, – and, and we're not going to read the whole book here together, of course. Uh, and I, I probably did put the midway break a little past the midpoint. Uh, sorry about that. But it's interesting that, again, you've got so many items and so many like tropes and uh, stereotypes and, and things that become such staples of the contactee genre. And they're here in these booklets from a guy – that very, very few people, uh, very, very few people know about. Now, Collins and Folkstrom, in addition to uh, sort of, sort of, you know, picking up on uh, as as anybody who reads it probably would, who knows about it probably would, the the similarities between um, between Aramia and Estralon, and on the one hand, and Orthon and Ara Reigns on the other. Um, I, I think uh, Ara Reigns is a bit less complex a character than Estralon. But uh, another thing that, that Collins and Falkstrom point out is that uh, the the speech that Aramia gives uh, about, um, you know, we will intervene against you, you leaders of destruction, is is very similar to what Klaatu would say in the, the 1951 version of The Day the Earth Stands Still. So – Again, not just presaging contact D stuff, but presaging um, films as well. Films that were uh, often often shown as inspirations for contact D ideas. So those are the materials we have from Drake in that period before the main contact D movement starts up. We do have some other things, and uh, I am. I am grateful to uh, the saucers that time forgot for not just writing about this, but providing links to some of these primary sources. We've got a little bit of, of a, a, a thing from Aramia uh, that was published in the Interplanetary News Digest, the second issue of that in um, 1954. And the Interplanetary News Digest was published out of Joshua Tree, California. Um, Genevieve Johnston was the editor of it. And you you basically have some articles. You've got some um, some pieces from other people. Bob Short, uh, contactee, uh, is, uh, has his visit with a spaceman in there. We're going to have to do a Bob Short um, episode at some point. But there is a little bit from Aramia, from Captain or Commander Aramia in this edition. Aramia, the Venusian commander of a space fleet. Greetings, O people of Earth, from the planet Venus. We have outer space which to correct some of the statements being made by Earthmen. No Earth people are being picked up by our craft in their physical bodies, nor using your terms being kidnapped. We are only picking up our own people whom we have landed in certain areas. 
We operate from a higher dimension. In that density, our bodies are more solid than yours, but they vibrate at a considerably higher frequency. We have taken Earth people in their more refined bodies, the etheric, that they might be acquainted with our mission, but none in their physical bodies. Such would have to be placed in a state of deep trance or suspended animation to withstand the terrific light and power which our craft generate. We are masters of the elements and use our minds and telepathic powers in a manner which Earth people cannot comprehend. During the coming months, a great deal of mischievous activity shall affect the psyche of Earth people, emanating from dark magicians, former Atlanteans and Murians, who went underground during the struggle between those two races during the last atomic age. As stated before, these are the ones who surround themselves with such noxious odors, who would confuse and deceive man into thinking they come from outer space. They are very cunning, they have considerable scientific knowledge, and are able to use free energy to construct ships of this substance. We caution you to be on your guard. Protect yourself by thoroughly checking all statements, all disk activity, in the light of your creator. Keep up your prayers for peace and impress your leaders that only through peace can you survive. This very much reads to me like a, a, a sort of, you know, be warned. The people who are calling themselves contactees are not actually contactees because you know, we would never pick up people in their physical bodies. That wouldn't work. There needs to be density changes and and suspended animation and and things like that. So it, it very much sounds like uh, like Drake is trying to um, trying to promote his own contact tales uh, over and above the claims made by others. But he doesn't write any books. He's publishing this stuff in his own obscure newsletter or at least yeah obscure we don't it, it isn't it isn't big compared to what you know the business that people like Bethram and and uh, and Adamski are doing it's it's obscure um he he wrote some about a UFO base in Antarctica in 1958 in the golden light uh golden light uh publication uh, but um it's it, it's you know it's as time goes on, it just becomes wrapped up in other UFO stuff. And as far as I know, he didn't invent this Antarctica thing. We've talked about the Antarctica thing before. He would also later in the 1950s and I think into the 1960s um, begin or continue doing uh, – doing, um, doing talks and presentations. He would appear with Daniel Fry's understanding organization. Uh, Collins and Falkstrom point out that there was a 1956 article uh, he was mentioned in, in the Saturday Evening Post. Um, it says, in Los Angeles, Eugene H. Drake, director of the Fellowship of Golden Illumination, photographs space creatures by infrared light and tape records their conversations. Drake claims to have toured Vetus on a gravitonic sled. Um by 1956, uh, in the Golden Light publication, he's talking about um, a, a building of worship in the Upper Joshua Desert, where they've he's had his his contacts. Um, it's it's interesting. He pops up at the Amalgamated Flying Saucer Club of America uh, convention in uh, in 1959. Uh, he's mentioned in a book called Faiths, Cults, and Sects of America. In a uh, in 1960, and then you know after the the early 60s, he kind of um, he kind of kind of drifts away, and uh, he dies in in 1973 from what we can from what we can find. So, what is there to say about this Eugene Drake character? Um, I, I think it's maybe not quite fair. To uh, just say, ah, Adamski and Bethram plagiarized Eugene Drake. I, I don't think that's the case. Um, I wish I could know some more details about just what connections and overlap might have existed between Drake's organization in Southern California in the 1940s and George Adamski's organization in California in the 1940s and the Borderlands Science Research Associates people in the 1940s. All these things are coexisting at the same time, all sort of, sort of generating space age ideas out of older theosophical ideas. And there had to be some interaction. There had to be some overlap. And we don't have solid – 
sort of connections. We don't have, you know, Drake saying, I was hanging out with George Adamski down in Laguna Beach last week. We don't have things like that. So it, there's there's a question. I There's a question of, of who influenced whom when, and I'm not sure we can ever get to the bottom of it. What I will say, I, I think, is that you've got some, um, over time, you've got some sort of snowballing, um, rolling downhill kind of one-upsmanship and brinksmanship. You've got Adamski and Drake talking about theosophical ideas. Then you've got UFO sightings beginning in 1947. And so you've got Adamski saying that he is is seeing these things with a telescope. And then he does his science fiction novel where he talks about the beings on different planets and their superior uh, their superior societies and civilizations and then drake one ups that by saying well back in 1930 i met these folks and i've i've been to um been to you know venus and i've met these uh, i've met these women and then you have truman bethram saying well hi i met a woman too and adamski saying well i met them out in the desert as well, or not as well. They're ignoring Drake. You don't see, you don't see Adamski talk about Drake. You don't see Truman Bethram talk about Drake. What I want to know, my biggest question is one, the first name of the Miss Tennyson who ghost wrote Bethram's book about Aura Reigns. And the next thing I want to know is did Miss Tennyson, was Miss Tennyson somebody who had been familiar with Drake's ideas? Because the overlap between um, Estralon and Aura Reigns is really, really fascinating. And I think what ex- excites me most about this is that we might find more things. We might find more overlaps. We might have to do new editions or um, of of contact ebooks. We might have to uh, have to fix these things. Um, but I will say that I was surprised and a little relieved to find that Greg Bishop. And Adam Gorightly do not have an entry for Eugene Drake in their book, A is for Ad- Adam Ski, their sort of encyclopedia of contactees. That was very gratifying that I am not the only person who <laughs> completely overlooked Eugene Drake uh, or who didn't know about Eugene Drake or, or didn't – honestly, might not have had enough information to do an entry on Eugene Drake. But it's – it's a fascinating thing. It's always fun to find one of these folks who you have never seen before. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this sort of look at Eugene Drake and the sort of proto contactee as much as I did. Thanks for listening. Remember to send in your questions and comments via the usual social media or email channels. We'll be addressing those next time. Our associate producer is Simpson J. Hanover III, and The Saucer Life is a production of Chizo Media, LLC. Chizo Media, our heart is with the people. Until next time, keep watching the skies, because the skies are watching you.